Good evening. I hope you managed to see the eclipse of the moon, uh, even though the weather, I'm afraid, was generally rather cloudy. But it wasn't a very good eclipse anyway from here. The moon was very low down. And there'll be a very much better eclipse of the moon in October, so I'll say more about it then. But, you know, it's a long time since we said very much about the moon on these programmes, and doesn't it seem a very long time indeed since Neil Armstrong made his famous one small step onto the barren rocks of the Mare Tranquillitatis, or Sea of Tranquillity, way back in 1969. That was a great moment, and there's a picture of that epic scene. Since then, there have been various other successful moon flights, and to my mind, one of the most exciting was that of Apollo 15. And there's an Apollo 15 shot showing the moon car. And in the background, one of the lunar Apennines, the peak we call Hadley Delta, which, I may say, is a great deal further away from that moon car than you might imagine, because estimating distances on the moon is always very difficult. But Apollo 15 drove right to the lip of the great valley on the moon known as the Hadley Rill. And that was a really exciting moment. And it's the rills I want to talk about tonight. But first of all, a few words about the moon itself. And here's a picture of the full moon. And I may say, this is the naked eye view with north at the top. And later on, when I show you telescopic pictures, I'm going to put them the telescopic way up with south at the top. But meanwhile, there is the full moon. And you can see those dark patches that we still call seas, even though it's a very bad name and there never has been any water upon the moon. And there to the upper left-hand side of the centre, you can see the great plain of the Mare Imbrium, or Sea of Showers, which is bounded in part by the lunar Apennines. Now remember, the moon is a great deal smaller than the Earth, it doesn't pull so strongly, and therefore it's not been able to hold on to any atmosphere. And today the moon is an airless world. There are no clouds, no wind, no water, no weather, and everything seems very sharp and clear-cut. And therefore we can always see the moon extremely well, particularly since it's so close to us on the astronomical scale. There are mountains there. The Apennines, I think, are the most spectacular of them. And you can see them here on the upper left-hand side of the picture, casting their shadows down onto the plain beneath. And there, to the lower right, you can see the great crater of Archimedes, which in fact is circular and is 50 miles across. And that gives you an idea of the scale of the picture. The Apennines go up to something like 17,000 feet in places, but there are isolated mountains as well. And one of these is Pico. There, in this picture, to the upper right, you can see part of the Bay of Rainbows. There's the 60-mile dark floor crater Plato. And above that, that's south of the picture, you can see Pico, which looks like a tiny patch there, but is, in fact, an 8,000-foot mountain. And there are plenty of those on the moon. But, of course, the entire lunar scene is dominated by those craters, which range from tiny enclosures up to vast walled plains uh, many miles in diameter. I think, myself, one of the most spectacular of all is Theophilus. And there it is, a huge enclosure, 64 miles across and 18,000 foot deep, with a magnificent group of central mountains. And you might imagine, looking at that crater, that it is, in fact, rather like a steep-sided mine shaft. But it's not. Appearances can be very deceptive. And when you see Theophilus in profile, as in this diagram, it is, in fact, uh, very much more like a shallow saucer. You can see there that the walls to either side rise to only a very modest height above the outer plain. Then the floor is sunken, and right in the middle there is the central mountain group. But of course, there are some craters which have no central mountains at all. And one of those is Plato. A few minutes ago, I showed you a picture of Plato taken from the Earth, and here's one taken from a lunar orbiter a probe going round the moon at the height of only a few tens of miles. And there you see the huge 60-mile dark floored crater with only a few craterlets in its interior. It really is a magnificent sight. But if Plato is dark, then the brightest feature on the moon is the crater Aristarchus. This is an Earth-based picture, one I took myself, actually. And there you can see the brilliant 23-mile crater. Below it, you can see a darker floored crater, which we call Herodotus, and coming out from Herodotus, there is, in fact, a huge winding valley called Schroeter's Valley that I'll talk about in a few minutes. We have crater pairs on the moon. Look at this lovely little pair of twins, Beer and Fuile. And also, we have ghost craters, craters that have been more or less obliterated. And one of those is called Stadius. By no means easy to make out now. There, in the upper right-hand corner of the picture, you will see in a minute the great crater of Copernicus, 56 miles across and a ray center. Down to the lower left is Eratosthenes, 37 miles across and very deep. 
and between the two, you can just about make out the outline of Stadius. Very hard to see now. It may once have been a magnificent crater, but it's been destroyed and overwhelmed by the Mare lava. As I said, these seas were never water-filled, but they were once oceans of lava. Other features on the moon include the so-called domes, and these really do look rather like terrestrial volcanoes. Here's one near the lunar crater Keys. You can see it there to the upper left of the center, almost in the middle now. It's a swelling uh, with a central pit, and there are plenty of those around. I said just now that the lunar craters are basically circular, and unless they've been broken or destroyed by later eruptions, uh, that is true. On the other hand, many of them appear foreshortened. Because remember, the moon is a globe, and when we look at the edge, we are seeing the craters in very foreshortened way. Look, for example, at Pythagoras, near the moon's north limb. There it is. It's a huge enclosure, nearly a hundred miles across, with terraced walls and a magnificent central mountain. And there, it looks like an ellipse. But in point of fact, Pythagoras is circular, and we are seeing it foreshortened. And we have a model here to show what's meant. There's a model crater, and we are seeing it from the side. Now, if we move the camera and see it from above, you can see that the crater really is circular. And that's why Pythagoras and all other craters near the moon's limb appear foreshortened into ellipses. I may say also that the craters always appear to stay in practically the same positions on the lunar disk, because the moon keeps the same side turned towards us all the time. The moon goes round the Earth in just over 27 days actually 27.3 days. Uh, to be accurate, the Moon and the Earth move together round their barycenter, or common center of gravity, of the Earth-Moon system. But as that lies deep inside the Earth's lobe, I think it's fair enough to say that for all practical purposes, the Moon goes round the Earth. Well, the Moon spins on its axis in exactly the same time, 27.3 days. And if you think about it, you'll realize that this means that the moon keeps the same side turned toward the earth all the time. And from the earth, the other side of the moon is permanently out of view. And so before 1959, when the Russians sent their probe Lunik 3 on a round trip and got back the first photographs, we had no positive information about what the far side of the moon was like. We now know that it's basically the same as the side we can see, Craters, mountains, valleys, not so many of the dark so-called seas, but the overall impression is very much the same. Now, how did those craters get there? There have been various theories, and I think the most popular one, certainly in America, is that they were formed by meteoritic impact. Meteorites, solid bodies from space, must have hit the moon. They also hit the Earth. And here's a picture of the most famous of all meteorite craters, that in Arizona, which is nearly one mile wide. And that's a photograph I took some years ago when I was flying over it. And you may remember that some time back, we did a complete sky at night program from inside the meteor crater. Well, most astronomers, I think, believe that the craters on the moon were formed by bombardment. Others prefer to believe that they were formed, essentially, by volcanic action. And we have volcanic craters on the Earth. Here is one in Iceland. Uh, it's spelt Vefjord, probably not what the Icelanders call it, but that's what I call it. And there we have a central mountain and again an impressive wall, and the size is much the same as that of the meteor crater, which of course is very small by lunar standards. As I say, opinions differ, and uh, in preferring the volcanic theory, I realize I'm probably in a very considerable minority. But we don't really know, and it may be some time before we find out. So there we have the lunar landscape. Mountains, peaks, craters, and of course, valleys. So let's have a look now at the most famous of all the lunar valleys, Skolna Schroeter's Valley, because it was first described in detail by the German astronomer Schroeter way back in the 1790s. Now there again is the brilliant crater Aristarchus, as I've said, 23 miles across, and so reflective that on more than one occasion it's been mistaken for an active volcano. There to the upper right is the darker floor of Herodotus, and from that, you can see the U-shaped winding valley of Schroeter's Valley, which you can see with a very small telescope under good conditions. Now, that's an Earth-based picture. It's also being photographed by probes, and there, in fact, is an Apollo picture of Schroeter's Valley. You can see the winding nature of it very well indeed. But it may not be entirely typical. Let's have a look now at another rill, or cleft, or valley, which you can see with a small telescope, and that is the so-called Rill of Hyginus. Hyginus itself is that crater near the top of the picture, and just to give you an idea of scale, it's four miles across. 
but you can see that the so-called rill is really made up of craters, craters that run together. And that's even more strongly brought out in this picture taken by a lunar orbiter. And you can see that the Huygens cleft really is not a valley at all, but a crater chain. And we do get riddles of all kinds on the moon. Some of these are the so-called sinuous riddles, which are very significant. Dr. Lionel Wilson of Lancaster has been making a very close study of sinuous riddles, and we are delighted to welcome him to the sky at night now. Welcome to the sky at night, Lionel. Thank you, thank you. First of all, can you say a bit about lunar riddles or valleys in general? Well, yes, Patrick, as you said, there are several varieties, and uh, the two commonest are the linear rills and the sinuous rills. Mm -hmm. And we've got a little simulation here which shows how we think these are formed. The linear rills, uh, we think, form when tensional stresses in the lunar crust produce fractures and the ground subsides between the fractures to form a rather straight-sided valley. The sinuous rills, however, um, seem to have been formed in some way by fluid flowing over the surface of the moon and eroding away the surface layers to produce a, a sinuous depression like this. So they can be quite close together. I mean, some photographs show rills of both kinds. That's right. And uh, as it happens, at the uh, Apollo 15 landing site, we have uh, examples of both of these. Um, at the bottom of the picture here, you can see a fairly straight parallel-sided valley, a depression. This is a, a linear rill. And, um, uh, near the top of the picture, coming into view now, we've got uh, the famous Hadley Rill, near which the Apollo 15 astronauts landed. Uh, this meanders across the surface from its source on the right-hand side of the picture here. Very tempting to think it was made by running water, isn't it? But of course, there never has been any water on the moon. No, that's right, Patrick. This was the very earliest idea, that uh, these were essentially river valleys produced by floods of water, perhaps produced when ice was melted beneath the surface. But um, in the mid-1970s, and we began to realize that probably these features had uh, an origin associated with volcanic processes. And uh, in fact, we can look at some film of uh, an eruption taking place on the Earth. Um, it's in Hawaii, isn't it? That's right, yes. And uh, this is a very vigorous eruption with lava coming to the surface very quickly and forming lots of lava flows, the streams you can see in the foreground there. Amazing, isn't it? The moon is such a quiet world now that cast one minds back a long, long time. And there, in fact, you have the same kind of thing happening on the moon, a violent volcanic landscape. That's right, yes. This kind of activity occurred on the moon, of course, more than 3,000 million years ago and hasn't happened more recently. Well, we can see here the lava flows moving off across the landscape, a very vigorous convection going on. And really, this is the key to how the rills were formed. The stirring up of the lava uh, transfers heat to the ground very efficiently. And it's this that causes the ground to warm up and melt and then be carried away by the flow, so that eventually a channel is formed, which the flow subsides into. Um, of course, we uh, can only now look at the, uh, the products of these eruptions, uh, since we don't have the activity still going on. No, indeed, um, the moon's rather quiet well these days. What about handle? Yes, there it is. Yes, that's right. This is a, a typical example of the kind of channel produced by one of these eruptions. The, the, the channel you can see there is about 40 miles long, half a mile wide, and uh, a couple of hundred feet deep. Um, the, uh, the sun's coming from the bottom of the uh, um, picture here, and uh, so you can see the source of the rill over on the left. I think we've got a, a close-up of that. Um, the circular crater is the place where the eruption took place, and then the flow moved off to the right and eroded the channel. And recently, an American colleague and I have been making lots of detailed measurements of the depth of the channel and the length. And from this, we can uh, deduce the uh, volume of lava which was erupted per second and how long the eruption went on for. It all fits. It does, yes. We find that uh, the eruptions must have gone on for many months to erode these channels. You can see the central part of the rail channel here, and uh, some rather complicated things happen. Uh, we think the flow fell into a depression, which it filled and then drained, and that produced this rather strange um, uh, elongate valley here. Well, we talk about the lunar seas, knowing full well that there never has been any water in them at all. There certainly were seas of lava at one stage, lava being magma that's come to the surface, and we can still see those magma flows. That's right, Patrick, yes. We've uh, got some very good photographs in Murray Imbrium of uh, flows here. Uh, they originate down at the bottom left of the, uh, the picture, and um, we can trace them uh, off through the middle of the picture here towards the right. And really, these flows were formed by very similar eruptions to the ones that produced the sinuous rills. The main differences are simply that um, the eruptions that produced the sinuous rills had a slightly larger volume of lava coming out, flowing down a steeper slope, and this is what made the lava turbulent, and that lets it cut a channel, whereas the more smooth flows simply sit on the surface. Bearing in mind, of course, that the force of gravity on the moon's surface is very much weaker than it is here. But there's nothing quite like a lunar sinuous rill on the Earth today. 
No, they don't form at the present time, mainly because the eruptions uh, that might produce them don't go on for long enough to actually cut a deep channel. You see the beginnings of the process, but it's not very well developed. Now, it's rather interesting that very recently some scientists at Cambridge have identified some features uh, which we see in the geological record, which relate to the Earth's early history. And at that time, we did have large outpourings of very fluid lavas, which did apparently produce sinuous roll channels on the Earth. Well, let's go get them now. Of course, one thing we can do now, which we couldn't do when we started the sky at night, was to examine lunar samples. We've actually got now particles of the lunar maria, which we can analyze. So what's it really told us about the moon's magma? Well, that's right. It's interesting that the, uh, the kind of uh, lavas which poured out into the lunar basins were uh, very similar to the kind of things that erupt in Iceland and Hawaii today. And we can look here at a simulation of how um, eruptions from the edges of the basins produce lavas which flooded in towards the middle, and then the weight of the lava causes the basin to subside very slightly. It's exaggerated here. And then successive generations of flows spread out towards the middle of the basin and form the maria as we see them today. We have to remember, of course, that when we talk about a young lunar formation, it's still very old indeed by our standards because all the real activity on the moon ended a long time ago and there's very little going on there today. Yes, that's right. Um, really, the earliest eruptions we can see relate to about 4,000 million years ago and the youngest to about 3,000 million years ago. Of course, the moon and the Earth aren't the only worlds with craters. We have Mercury, Venus, and, of course, on Mars. Here's an Earth-based picture of Mars with its polar cabinet, red deserts. And from the Martian probes, we've got magnificent pictures of Martian volcanoes and valleys. And there's the structure known as the chandelier. I wonder, Lionel, what's the relationship, we think, between the Martian riddles and those of the Moon? Well, we actually seem to have a wider variety of types of riddles on Mars than we do on the Moon. The ones we were just looking at, for example, are really uh, examples of uh, linear riddles. Um, but we, uh, we certainly find some other types of valley. We could uh, look at a picture, for example, which shows some uh, valleys at the top here, which we think probably were formed on Mars by running water, which was an idea we, we discarded for the Moon. But uh, there seem to have been episodes when ice uh, melted beneath the surface and poured out on, onto the surface to form river valleys. Um, but we also find many examples of genuine sinuous rolls with the same kind of lengths and depths and sinuosities uh, as the lunar examples. Obviously, Earth, Moon, and Mars have evolved in different ways. They've cooled down at different rates. The Earth's slowest and the Moon quickest, was this, uh, the Moon is smaller. That's right, yes. This seems to be, have been the main factor controlling the uh, volcanic history of these bodies. Um, w we can look at the simulation here showing the Moon being the smallest, having the largest surface area for its volume, cooling fastest, and then Mars cooling afterwards. And the Earth, of course, has, has cooled a little, but uh, there's still a great deal of internal heat. And uh, this is why we think activity ended, volcanic activity ended on the Moon about 3,000 million years ago, on Mars perhaps 1,000 million years ago, and of course the Earth is still very volcanically active. And of course there is Venus, just about the same size as the Earth and probably a highly volcanic world. That's right. They should have had very similar histories. Of course, we can't see the surface of Venus because of the clouds, yeah. so we have to use radar techniques. And this is a radar map from uh, one of the American probes. Uh, red is the highland here and blue are the lowlands. And recently, the Soviet Union have uh, had two probes taking radar images of Venus. We can see here some fold mountain systems at the top of the slide and a plain with a volcanic crater, as it happens, in it um, here in the center. We're still uh, analyzing these images. And uh, interestingly enough, we haven't actually found any sinuous rule channels on Venus yet. No, the sinuous fields may not be peculiar to the moon, but certainly the moon contains more than any other world. Mm. You know, when we started doing these programs, the moon seemed very far away. It's anything but that now. But the more we learn, the more it seems that we've got to find out. And we don't know all about the moon yet. We don't even know the full story of the sinuous rills. But certainly, even though men have been there, and we've got now got detailed maps of the entire surface, I don't think the moon has lost any of its magic, do you? No, I don't. And I think anyone who takes a telescope or even a pair of binoculars and goes out and looks at those craters and mountains and valleys will see what we mean. Mm -hmm. Lionel, thank you very much. And for both of us, and for the moon, good night. That edition of The Sky at Night will be shown again next Saturday at 6.35 on BBC Two.